definitions. You've got a standard, what I would call a dictionary definition of grit, courage and resolve, strength of character. Angela Duckworth, who's the person we just heard from a moment ago, she talks about long-term vision as well. Right, that the learning that we're doing has in mind that you're going to be using it down the road and you really want to achieve long-term success. So whether you pitch that part to your students or not is up to you. But minimally, I think it's important for the students for the short term to know that not everything's going to be rosy. There are going to be bumps along the way. That's part of the process, and that actually can be a good thing. Right? It's not always that we should have it easy. Would you like to talk about three, please? Sure. Resilience is like flexibility. Okay. And I think someone who's able to balance that has a, a good level of self-esteem yeah. that it um, kind of encompasses the courage and it encompasses uh, the rest of them. But what, what are the words, thank you for that, what are the words in that sentence that you would say really speak to resilience in particular? In other words, what Above makes... What, unforeseen there you surprises. Go, unforeseen sur surprises, mm -hmm. right? That's going to happen in life. Right? There are going to be issues, things that I didn't expect, didn't go as easily as I thought whatever it might be. Do I have the resolution and the resolve to fight through that and to be able to still be a success? Anyone else on resilience before I move on to number four? There were a lot of hands about number three. Anything to add there? Okay, would anyone from the four team like to pipe up with a, um, a description as to why you chose that? Yes? I didn't choose this, but now that I'm reading it, when you have a goal to aim towards, uh -huh. it, it, you have somewhere to go. You have a direction uh -huh. to, okay. to get to. Okay. Focus is you? Yes, Ms. Faria? I want to say that if you're an ordinary person, uh -huh. like I'm talking about myself, like I feel like I'm ordinary. I, I don't feel like I'm brainy. I can do anything. I'm not superior, so mm -hmm. in order to get anywhere, mm -hmm. I have to set a goal. Mm -hmm. I have to say education is important, this is important, that's important, mm -hmm. dinner is important, whatever is my goal, mm -hmm. and I have to put a lot of energy into sure. that goal. Beautiful. You're familiar with SMART goals? Okay, SMART goals, you might want to look those up. Those are good for anything. It could be anything from a, um, a career-related goal, smart. such as oh, I yes, want... Smart goal. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna to describe what they are in more detail in just a moment. Uh, let's say, for example, I want to integrate more kinesthetic learning in my classroom. So I create a SMART goal for that purpose. I want to make a, a, a better lifestyle choice. Anything associated with diet, with exercise, with who knows what. I'm going to make a SMART goal towards that end. What does it mean? SMART stands for specific. M stands for measurable, A stands for achievable. There are other words you could use as well. R is um, relevant. relevant, thank you, and T is time bound. So you want goals that are small, that are focused, that you could measure, and that you could attribute to time. So for example, if my goal is I need to um, lose three pounds. So what steps will I take in order to achieve that? How much time will I give myself to do that? And of course, the measurable is I jump on the scale and I determine if I'm there, if I'm not there. If I'm going to add kinesthetic learning opportunities, that's a quantifiable measure, right? By what time am I going to ask myself to do that? And what is it going to look like in all of these kinds of things? Now, there's one other part to four that I think is very important. Does anyone want to look at it again and see if there's something else that deserves attention? Lots and lots of practice. Lots and lots of practice. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah? Okay, thank you. I heard it from a few people. Right? They say that all the great people, the Beethovens, forgive me, the Michael Jordans of the world, anyone who has distinguished themselves as being superior, it's typically not just because of their, what we might call God-gifted or God-given talent, but rather the effort, the practice, the work. And the proof is that for every one of those people that succeeded, there are others who are also gifted in similar ways, we have to assume, that did not succeed. And then you have many people who maybe had pedestrian talent, but really rose to greatness because they worked at it and they worked at it and they worked at it until they achieved. So being an enduring person, so to speak, is somebody who focuses on setting goals and really work, is committed to the practice part of it in order to ensure that the goals are met. Okay? These are some qualities of grittiness. 
Any questions? Isn't that that old uh, story, the tortoise and the hare? Yes. So the tortoise won the race. That's what this is. The tortoise was gritty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay. Slow okay. Slow but steady. Okay, slow but steady. Slow but steady. Nice. Yes. So I think, I mean, I chose endurance as my number two. Go ahead. But I think it's the most challenging in a generation of I mean, instant gratification uh -huh. for them to follow through on it. Right. And I think it's a skill we have to kind of yeah. teach them. Because it's something we have to teach. The right? rest they can follow through on mm -hmm. it. You know, mm -hmm. you have a goal, you have to go with the flow, so to speak. But yeah. the endurance to keep on plugging away is very hard for kids who are just used to getting it immediately. Yeah, I would agree with that. You also may want to choose to think about how you could use this for your students if you want to use it with them. Of course, if everybody does it at the same time, they might be thinking you just had a workshop on grit or something. So I think a little strategy and conversation would probably be a good idea. But minimally, there may be, and there may be a specific place. Maybe there's a mechanechas. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a student skills class or something like this, which is just more naturally appropriate for this conversation. But if every student has it, of course, if they're doing it in ninth grade, you have to decide next year if you want to do it again with now the tenth grade. You know, all of that is something you could figure out. The point is, it's something that's available to you that may enhance your relationship with your students and encourage them to go beyond their, what we might call, you know, uh, obstacles and limiting beliefs, which are commonplace for everybody, but for kids in particular. Any final thoughts on grit for the moment? Okay, so we're going to move out of Gridville, and we're going to move now into something called uh, fixed and growth mindsets. Now I'm going to define it for you briefly. We're now on the second page of your handout. I'm going to show you a video soon as well from the aforementioned Carol Dweck, who Angela Duckworth talked about, and to understand a little bit more about her research. Have you ever said something along the lines of, I'm not a math guy? Or, 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 extra, or, or, or skiing is not for me, or whatever? something along those lines, right? We've probably all in one form or another said something about ourselves that was evidence of a fixed mindset. It doesn't mean that that's where we are all the time necessarily. It just means that we have part of our persona, part of our mindset includes this. And I would guess in most cases it's because we've encountered some challenge in that area or arena sometime along the way. We learn as students what we're good at and what we're not good at. Maybe not necessarily because we really genuinely are or are not, as much as maybe the way that the teacher's class was set up. Again, not really our conversation, but at the end of the day, we can oftentimes, sorry, um, develop a fixed mindset as it relates to ourselves. And fixed basically is the belief that our intelligence or our talent are fixed. That means that they're not going anywhere. This is how much intelligence the good Lord has given me, this is how much talent I have been bequeathed, and this is how much I have the ability to utilize. Whereas a growth mindset says that I have basic abilities, but I have the ability to grow those abilities. I have the ability to go beyond what I see as my reality today, and to improve and to become better, and to ultimately be very successful in this area. Dedication, hard work. <coughs> Dedication, yeah. It doesn't happen, it doesn't happen through wishful thinking. It, like we talked about before, with the lots of practice. You have to know what you want to do, and to be committed to doing it, and to determine what are the steps that I need to take in order to get there. If you want to do better on a test, and you're consistently not succeeding, you talk with the teacher and you say, well, why is it you think that my essays are consistently being marked as substandard? But they wouldn't use that language, but you get the idea. And so you'll have a conversation. It seems like you're missing key ideas or you're not developing it properly. Why don't we, before the next test, sit down beforehand and review some key ideas and ask you orally to present to me what you would typically write if that appeared on the test? It's more work for the teacher, but at least it gives them an avenue by which to begin that journey. And if you don't have the time and availability, maybe there's a colleague that they could turn to. But at least you're giving them some thoughts about it. I'm not fixed. I just don't do essays or don't do them very well. Right? What we can start to do is you can do better on essays if, and you lay out very clearly what that if looks like. Now, the more that you've given them structure, such as a rubric, where they know what the criteria are, as well as gradients of quality, meaning to say these are the things that you need and this is what excellence looks like. This is what very good looks like and what good looks like and what poor, average, something like that looks like. 
the more you're giving them a vision of what to shoot for and towards. That's really helpful. But even without a rubric, it can give them some practical use, useful tips, hopefully, that they can take and use to their, to their benefit. Dealing with the restrictions of the regions yes. on these type of on this type of education, mm -hmm. it's not the mindset that's the problem. It's it's the regions is very much curriculum based and test oriented, mm -hmm. and doesn't give us the time to try to do all the different uh, creative type of learning that would possibly benefit their mastery of the subject. But we just got to get there. Got to get through it. Got to. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, that, is, that is a tension that I'm not able to throw some pixie dust on and make this appear. Um, what I can tell you is that sometimes if you are thinking about this issue and you know that there's certain, let's call it, informational dissemination that has to happen, you may be able to speed that up a little bit in order to get to some of the things that are really going to deepen your learning. <clears throat> so, for example, when I taught this Jewish history class that I referenced before, I had 2,100 years of history that I needed to teach in one sophomore grade. Uh, and Friday was a, was a rotating period. So we had four and a half periods a week to learn quite a bit of content. So there I used certain types of things, including I created a PowerPoint of the entire course and I uh, gave the, student, the students the course slides. They had to fill in the notes. You can print three slides a page with lines adjacent and then they can fill in that information. That gave me more time to do things like debates and role play and all sorts of creative types of engagements that I wouldn't have been able to do if I spent the entire time dictating, writing on the board, and having the students copy, just as an example. There are many things that we can do to speed things up as far as giving the information so that we have more time to discuss and engage. But as it relates to the process of YET specifically, I'm not sure that I have to necessarily view that as a regents or curriculum driven issue. I think you could have that going on while still being true to the fact true to the fact that um, you know you're, you're telling a student that just because at this stage in the game you didn't demonstrate success doesn't mean I'm closing the book on you so you can keep sort of a fluidity to your course you could have students in different places in the journey while still in terms of the content that you're sharing the new content you may be over here, but you're giving another student an opportunity to cycle back and to work towards achievement of a previous unit through various activities or various interventions or things like that. So I think every teacher needs to know her realities and work within the constructs of those realities. Sometimes you may say it's more important that they succeed here than, I don't want to say that on the regent, that maybe than in some other areas. And that's something they'll have to talk to you and to the administrative team to figure out what's appropriate. You know, I'm a big believer that students achieve success, that they feel like they're accomplishing, but it's success that they have to work towards, not just we hand it to them. And if we give them the right amount and they balance it properly and all those things, hopefully they, we, we can say that they had a good year and that they were successful according to everyone's definition. Thank you for that. Any other thoughts or questions? Certainly something to think about. Okay, so here you have a little bit of a polarity between the growth and the fixed mindset. The growth mindset basically says I can learn anything I want. When I'm frustrated, I persevere. Whereas the fixed mindset talks about I'm either good at it or I'm not good at it. My wife and I have this running joke. I'm the language arts history guy. She's the math and science person. So when the kids come home with math homework, they go to her. When it's about language and things like that, they turn to me. And of course, with Lumidia Kodesh, it's a different conversation. But the point is that we have, we have different strengths, let's call it, and that's OK. But the point is that we can say to ourselves, I'm not good at it yet, but if I'm committed to it, I will become good at it over time. And that's an important thought. Do you remember she talked about how you should praise the process? Don't praise the intelligence or the talent. Typically, we'll talk about if we have time, if you praise intelligence or talent, what you're basically doing is you're creating a certain standard for a child, which the child doesn't want to let go of. And as a result, first of all, I think morally it's not really the right thing to do because it's nobody's fault that they were given more gifts or less gifts. That's one issue, right? To say, oh, you're so smart when a child had no control over how intelligent he or she was created, it seems a little hollow to me. But leaving that detail alone, <clears throat> if you praise intelligence or talent, the child will work typically less hard at future challenges because they don't want to risk losing their status. 
And so anything that you're going to ask them to do that's going to be a stretch beyond just knowing, let's just say, the information, and now you want them to do something with the information, they may be resistant to do that because they're afraid of the implications. Whereas if you praise their process, then everything is a process. Right? Any learning is a process. Any engagement is a process. So if you praise how they invested in the process, hopefully they will continue to invest in any process that you ask them to be part of because of what you've trained them. So how can teachers help? Okay, we talk, I, I don't think I have the time to show you. I have a couple of other short videos. But for now, we'll just assume that most of what we needed was shared in the first two that we saw. Okay, we talked about this a moment ago. Don't praise intelligence because they want to remain intelligent. So praise processes, efforts, and strategies. What did you do to get there? How did you approach this? Tell me about your struggles. Tell me about what you did to overcome those struggles. And build that into your grade. We'll see if we have time to really discuss that. But actually giving them a way by which to assess it, either as part of the actual score, or perhaps some other way by which to assess it and reward it. Because it is important for the, we need to remember that learning doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are parts, of, there are different things that go into that learning and that process. The more the students see how the back end is ultimately a useful and necessary component, the more they're willing to invest in that back end as they move forward. Did you want to say something? Yeah. By praising an action and not a treat and saying they're going to be fixed on that action, let's say you tell them they're smart. They're not going to want to try because they don't want to show that maybe I'm like if they I don't fail, They don't want to risk I'm looking not, not smart. smart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they said that you're risking that status that you've created. We create artificial status all the time. And most of the kids very quickly, they do that on their own. Oh, she's the smart one in the class. And they learn that pretty fast. You know, after a few, after a few years of teachers uh, compliments and, and grades and things like that. We all know, you know we, we, teachers like to pretend that we're not going to play the game of selection and, 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 and ranking and all this. And that's fun. We can call all of them the A class, whatever thing we want to do. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But let's not kid ourselves for a second to think that the kids don't know in their mind who the so-called smart ones are and who are not capable and all this kind of thing. They know. Now, does that mean that they necessarily treat the others unfairly or, or improperly as a result? Hopefully not. But, you know, let's not delude ourselves. Now, on the other hand, if we're about praising the process, that's a different conversation. But how often have you had a classmate in 8th grade, in 12th grade, you graduated with that person, they seem to be very pedestrian, run-of-the-mill, nothing special, right? And then they all of a sudden became a very successful person at something, whether that's in the community, in the workplace, or whatever. And then you've had people who were in your yearbook as most, li most likely to succeed, right? Everybody who looked up to them, they were just so great. And then life came along and they're okay. Or maybe not even so okay, everybody's different. But that eighth grade or twelfth grade barometer is not always a legitimate barometer of what the future will bring. And the kids should hear that message, I think, as well. Let them know that ultimately life is a journey. It doesn't end with school. And it's a matter of if we are committed to a process, and if we feel that we can work towards our goals, that's where typical and true success can be found, the more that they'll be inclined to believe you and to act in that way. Okay? So you need to teach it. Let them know that confusion is normal. Let them know that struggle is natural. Right? Even the best of people have difficult moments here or there. Don't be deflated by it. Right? Allow yourself to work through the process. Did you want to say something? No, I'm looking at that. You get smarter. That's a good way to encourage Uh-huh. That is true. This one over here? Yeah. When you push yourself further, think about it like exercise. You saw that in the video. The brain is a muscle. The brain is a muscle that needs exercise. The more that you exercise the brain, you will build more connections. The more the connections that you build, the more capacity the brain has. But the brain has been measured to actually be physically heavier. Those that have, let's call it, more the people who work it harder than those brains that do not because it actually adds mass to the actual uh, muscle or tissue of the brain. Okay? And it may help in all sorts of ways, not just in the classroom. It could help in the social, emotional realms as well. Students who feel that they're not popular, students who feel that they don't have the ability to make friends, these kinds of things. You encourage them and you give them a pathway forward and brainstorm with them. Who knows? 
there's a good chance that they will at least become better than where they are today. Sorry for running through, but I do know that we're up against our back end. Okay? Have them think about why did you fail in the past? Could it be you didn't study enough? Could it be you had a family simcha or a family issue? Could it be that you weren't um, concentrated and concentrating in class efficient? Whatever it might be. Or could it be that maybe just we need to approach the material with different modalities or some other approach? All of those are possible, right? The beauty of teaching is that it's not a science, it's an art. We rely on science to give us some information, but ultimately it's an art, it's a feel, it's a conversation. And every teacher is going to have that separately with her student. And so you have to figure out in your particular context, what is it that's, that I'm doing that's working for you? What is it that you need additional support with? And then figure out the best pathway forward to help that particular child. And the more that they can own the process, as well as making it temporary, if they think of it as permanent, there's no conversation. This is the way I am. That's fixed mindset 101. But a growth mindset is about, it was a temporary situation. I realized it could have done better. Next time I will. But the cause was better. The cause, that? that's right. So here, for example, I could have studied harder. Right? That's an example. Now, is that the only contributor? Maybe not. And maybe you have to help the student figure out some other ones. But at least it's a starting point. Yeah. And then she's owning it more. So if the child doesn't care, it's going to be more challenging to encourage them to care. to care. Right. But you could at least try to build, justify some reasons as to why this is important for you. Sometimes it's just about the GPA or something like that. Sometimes it's because you're able to connect them to something in life where this could be useful. Right? Different examples like that. Um, it's going to be difficult for you to be them. You're not them, you're you. They're them. They have their own life to live. And a teacher can't be everything for everyone, but at least you can try to get them to think in those terms. And the more that they're committed fundamentally to want to succeed, the easier it's going to be for you. Because at least you have something to work with. Okay? Try to tap into passion wherever you can. That's going to help as well. That means if the students are intrinsically interested in something, the more you can offer them choice in how to do something, in what topic to study. So to use that Jewish history course, the, the, the year-end uh, project that I gave them was, this was a school where using the web was actually encouraged. And so I gave them, using the concept of Travelocity, I created TravelHistory.com and a fictitious time machine. And you can go back into any era of Jewish history that we studied in the second semester. So let's say the Middle Ages and prior to that, you know, going back to the time of Churban Bayashani, whatever it might be. So you're going to go to Spain, 1492, and you're going to create a travel itinerary for me and for my entire group. And you have to find an information about how they dressed and what they spoke and what they wore, I'm sorry, what they ate, and all sorts of, let's call it genero generic information, as well as specifically Jewish information. The Rabbanim of the time, and the challenges of the time, and how big the community was, and where they lived, all this kind of stuff. And you're going to create an itinerary for where we're going to go on day one and day two and how long we're going to stay and all these kinds of things and put it up on a website. So it had a lot of different pieces to it. I gave them opportunity to choose where they wanted to visit. I also gave them an opportunity to choose which criteria to focus on. There was a range, a value, all sorts of things. The more that you give them a choice, or if you see that they're particularly good at something, like someone who loves to write, let them choose topics of their own. Or maybe pair them up with a mentor to accentuate, build upon their strengths, accentuate what they're already good at. That's an important piece that we oftentimes forget about. We're so worried about, you ever see that video where, it, where it's like, not Animal Farm, but it's like, um, you see, it's like a story about, about animals who go to school, animal school or something like this, and uh, how, how the squirrel got punished for not being able to go up the right way, and the duck got punished for not flying properly, or the, whatever, different animals. And of course, when it's animals, it seems so obvious, right? You can't penalize the polar bear for not flying properly and getting a D in flying, right? But we think of that with kids, we sort of lump them all together as being all equal, and therefore, as a result, we utilize these artificial measures by which to, uh, to evaluate them. But the key point here is that we should spend more time on what are they good at. Not because we only want to focus on what they're good at. That won't really create growth mindset. But it certainly will reinforce the idea that this is where my passion is. 
this is where my primary strengths lie, because we do have primary strengths, everybody does, and how can I go ahead as a teacher and encourage more of that, and give the child opportunity to express and demonstrate her abilities through that particular area of capacity and strength. Okay? Remind them that real growth is only, right, if you, again, using exercise, for example, how do you build bigger muscles? It's when you push yourself and your muscle tears and it has to repair itself and then it grows as a result. Or you have to push yourself to the very edge and then you're able to grow further. And that's true for all, all forms of growth. Struggle is not the same as stupidity. Struggle just means not yet. We're not quite where we need to be, but we will get there if we put in the proper, proper efforts. And students who don't ever get challenged because they're afraid of challenge will really never grow. So, a lot of these refrains you've heard in different forms. Any questions or comments at this point? I know I have to wrap up, but I do want to make sure that we're clear. Okay. And then encourage practice. Okay, and we'll, and we'll stop here with this last slide. So encouraging practice and, and giving them opportunity to review. So to review what we talked about and the goals that we set, we introduced two concepts, grittiness as well as growth mindset. What would you say are the key attributes of grittiness? key qualities? Perseverance. Perseverance, I'm sorry. Endurance. Endurance, practice. Courage. What was that? Courage. courage, yes, excellent. Remember career? Resilience. Okay. What was that? Resilience. Resilience. Excellent. I heard something over here. Same? Okay. Yes? Excellent. Excellent. As opposed to perfection. Right. Right? You can't, if you go for perfection, then it's very finite, and then you end. Uh -huh. Okay, good. All right. And then growth mindset? The power of yet, right? right? The idea that I'm not that I'm not defined by my current reality, but my current reality is just where my starting point. And now I have to figure out how do I get to the next step. The people who have the growth mindset think of that way intuitively. They're just naturally wired, if you can call it that, to say, okay, I'm not there yet, right? But I'm going to people who change careers, for example. But right? it's not a simple thing to, to do that. But sometimes you say to yourself, well, I was in the classroom, now I'm going to become a principal, I'm a principal, now I'm going to become a, a coach or facilitator, I'm a this, I'm going to become a that. Whatever that might be, it's because you are willing to learn more and to change where you were for the purpose of getting to a better place, at least the way you envision it going down the road. And so if we focus on these, first of all, we model it ourselves. I think it's good practice to talk about it. Okay, girls, I want you to know today was a difficult morning for me because... But this is what I'm doing in order to get past it. I was having a difficulty in a, in a, in a personal matter, depending on how, how much information you wish to share, but I decided to do this, and that's what allowed me to get past it. Something like this. Obviously, ways that they can relate to. And this way, they see it modeled. Give them examples of success stories of people who had challenges that overcame them through grit and growth mindset. And the more that you can give them those examples, and the more that they can see the benefit of that, and actually you can assess them towards that, as we talked about before, where you put it in either as a regular grade, or perhaps you integrate it as one of those behavioral or, or uh, whatever you might call them, non-academic grades, but something else where you're assessing their tenacity and their effort, the more they will see the importance of it, and ultimately the more they will work towards making that part and parcel of who they are.